Um, so welcome. We're going to go through our info session today for our Protofacturing Hardware Accelerator. We have a handful of us on the call today. We're going to do introductions in just a minute. Um, but we're going to spend the next probably half an hour going through some details of the program. Please, as we go, feel free to drop any questions in the Q&A, in the chat. Um, we will field questions at the end. If we catch them as they're coming in, we will try to field them live if we are able to. But we will have time at the end for questions. So as we go, feel free to drop those in. Our agenda for today, we're going to run through a few different things. We're going to talk first about our team and our philosophy. So what do we do here at Rev? Who would you be interfacing with? What, what is our big picture? What are our goals for you all um, and as uh, an organization here? What we do? Then we're going to talk about the program specifically. So protofactoring, what is it? Uh, what does this word mean? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll run through program expectations, the facility that we have here, the resources that we have, um, and that'll tie right into the wrap up of the program, talking about the program tiers and the resources that would be available to you in the different tiers of the program. And like I said, if you just jumped on, please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A as we go, and we will do our best to either field those as they come in or we'll field them at the end. So generally speaking, who are we here at Rev? We'll start with Rev as a space, as an incubator. We are uh, people who are passionate about hardware. We're really a mix of a variety of different groups of people, but we kind of fall into these same four tracks. We're either hardware engineers, we're people who love hardware, uh, typically mechanical or electrical, sometimes a few designers, um, software engineers, and so on, but hardware, hardware engineers predominantly. Cornell faculty, students, staff, um, so a mix of different Cornell resources coming into our programs here. We have a number of experienced entrepreneurs, hardware entrepreneurs that have gone through this process before, as well as um, non-hardware folks who are really experienced in the entrepreneurship space or in specific sectors. And then we have a handful of technical mentors as well. So different uh, outside folks who help us out on the technical development side or that you might interact with from a technical perspective, as well as those entrepreneurs who would advise from a business perspective. And then we'll switch over to some team specific introductions. We'll start with Ken. Hey everybody, I'm Ken Rother. I'm the director of REV and the founding director of our hardware programs, um, a two-time entrepreneur with successful exits to publicly traded uh, companies, but I've been working with startups pretty much exclusively for the last dozen years, both here down at Rev and as a faculty up at Cornell, uh, where I teach in the business school and occasionally engineering. Um, I focus a lot on, on sort of the business side of things and, you know, business model, getting things funded, but I have a pretty big interest in electronics and sort of the underlying technology. So looking forward to working with y'all. Uh, my name is Deanna Coker. I'm the associate director of our hardware programs. I am more on the technical side, so to balance Ken out, I do more on the technical front and have an interest, have some experience on the business side, but the technical product development front is really mostly where I work. My background's in mechanical engineering and product design. I did my master's degree kind of around robotics and working with children, so I've been on a number of different fronts here. I've worked kind of across industries, been here for two going on three years, so worked with a number of different startups through the through the past few years and cycles of our programs, but uh, I do run our technical program, so I'm the main main uh, contact person there. Hello, I'm Lindsay. I am a product development engineer here at Rev. I just started at the beginning of the summer um, at the start of our prototyping hardware accelerator, um, so I'm more technical side like Deanna as well. Um, prototyping, design thinking, user needs, and testing. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Maya Minter. Um, I work on the programs and operations team. So I help to support a number of programs um, through the Center for Regional Economic Advancement. And um, one of them is the Protofacturing Accelerator with REV. Um, so you will hear from me during the application process if you're applying. I also kind of do kind of the behind the, the scenes stuff for scheduling um making sure that our mentors one of which i see is on the call hi Ela, um are kind of meeting with teams and then also just helping out with um, those cornell resources to make sure everyone is um you guys are all feeling supported and work with the program team closely so excited to see everyone here all right 
Um, and then our last team member we want to introduce is Jen. Jen could not be on the call today, unfortunately, but Jen runs all of our food and ag programs. So if you are an ag tech entrepreneur, you are interested in the ag space or the food space, Jen is Jen is one of our main contacts here. She runs a number of different programs. If you've heard about Grow New York, that's the big one. That's a big prize competition that we run here in upstate New York. So Jen is our lead for those programs and you would interface with her if you were interested in the ag space or you were working on something around food and ag. So we want to touch quickly on our philosophy. So as a team, we kind of circled around here talking about business development, technical development. One of our key things is that we really emphasize the simultaneous development of the technology and the business model. So you need everything to line up to really make sure you found product market fit to make sure that you're advancing the product and you're advancing the business at the same time so that everything's working together. We practice lean startup, really, really focused on involving the customer. If you haven't heard the term customer discovery yet, you will hear it many times throughout protofacturing if you are admitted to the program. Um, I think we have signs up around here that ask, have you talked to a customer today? That's one of the most important things you can do. So we're really focused on involving the customer at various stages of development. Surrounding the entrepreneur with support, um, as I mentioned, you saw that we have different backgrounds, different expertise. We really try to make sure that we have either the people here that you can work with or get you to the right people to help support you on your journey to scale and grow a company. And like I mentioned, prototyping, iterative, really focus on validating as you go. So lots of iterations, making sure you're getting those validation touch points as you advance your product. That's our basic introduction. We're going to switch now talking a little bit about the program. What is protofacturing? You probably have not heard of this word before. It was a term that we came up with when we were sitting down. We said there's a gap in our programs. We've got an accelerator for prototyping. We've got an accelerator for manufacturing. And there's kind of this, this dead space in the middle that we don't talk about. And we were trying to come up with the term for it. And we decided protofacturing is the term because it's exactly what it sounds like. It's you're kind of half in prototyping, you're half in manufacturing. Um, and you got to really transition between the two. So prototyping specifically is an in-between program. It means that you've gotten a prototype, you've gotten a proof of concept, you know that this thing will work. You need to figure out how to make it scalable. You need to figure out how to make it repeatable. So if you look at um, our general pipeline, which is over here on the right, starting off with problem identification, moving all the way down through mass production, you see the protofacturing is situated right in the middle here. You're at around the MVP stage or proof of concept and you're trying to get towards that engineering validation. It's repeatable, um, it's ready to be manufactured, and then you get into moving forward to mass production, which is in our manufacturing accelerator. So some of the things that we have as goals for this program, focusing on validating that business model. So we'd like to say later stage customer discovery, you're moving around your canvas, making sure that you've validated all the different aspects and areas on that canvas. You have some evidence that you've made the right decisions, you've designed the right, uh, business model as you move forward. So you've got all the right pieces in place before you, you go forward um, and invest more and more into your company and invest more and more into your product. On the prototyping technical side, uh, what, one of the biggest goals for this program is piloting. So you had a prototype or you have a prototype. It is working in most capacities and you are trying to get it pilot ready so that you can get it out into the hands of your customers and make sure that you've gotten everything that your early adopters need packaged up into one product before you scale that up, right? You need to make sure that it really satisfies your value proposition, your customer is happy, and you try to debug as much as you can in this piloting phase. So you're focusing on getting a pilot going. That might be 10, that might be 50, depending on your product. It could be 100. Really depends on what your product is and your ability to launch, launch a pilot. And then we transition to preparing documentation for scale and really finalizing the design. So we take that feedback from the pilot, did it go well? What were the issues? We integrate all of that, and then we start to move it forward to something that's more final. Lastly, I think one of the areas that we focus on a lot in this program is really the prepping to scale, which a lot of times comes down to funding. Maybe it's pre-orders, maybe it's grants, but making sure that you have the funding available to manufacture products. So we outline what your costs are going to be. You might go through some initial quotes and figure out what, what amount of funding do you need to get to scale, what scales um, are you actually talking about when you when you think about manufacturing technology? How many, what volume is appropriate? Um, so we really focus on developing some of those web testing methods, figure out where are you getting click-throughs? Did they click on it $100? Did they click on it at 150? So we talk about some different strategies there and help you finalize that funding strategy overall. Right. So 
the question that maybe you're thinking of right now, at least I know I would be thinking of if I were in your place is, is this the right program for me? How do you know if this is positionally correct? Because like I said, protofacturing is kind of an in-between space. So this is the right program for you if you have a at least mostly functional initial prototype. You're roughly around the proof of concept, maybe an integrated prototype, but you've got something that generally works. You know that you are not defying the laws of physics. This can be achieved, and now you need to figure out how to clean things up to actually make it repeatable. You probably have a low volume prototype, so you've been working with 3D printed parts, maybe laser cut parts, possibly some low volume manufactured parts. If there wasn't a ton of overhead tooling cost to those parts, you maybe have 100, 150, maybe you've got some lower volume methods in place, but you don't have anything high volume yet. You have evidence of product market fit. This is a big one, and this looks like a variety of different things. So basically, you have a way to say there is a customer, there is a, a value that I'm offering, and my solution achieves it. Um, and you are now being like confidently moving forward to say someone out there wants my product, um, and I want to put money into it. So um, you have a reason, you have someone that you know would buy it or you feel very confident would buy it and you are able to move forward, hopefully hopefully very confidently and happily, um, optimistically, if nothing else, because you know that you have something that has traction. Um, you may have a funding strategy or existing funding that could be a big part of product market fit. Maybe you had a, a pre-sale campaign or something like that. So you could have funding. You might be setting up in the next couple of months to come into funding but you have some way of outlining that you have product market fit and that you have a funding strategy in place that's going to help you move forward. Some things that you normally don't have if you're looking at the protofacturing program. You don't have high volume manufactured products. So if you have um, die cast parts, you are likely farther along than is appropriate for protofacturing. If you have a full team of engineers, so you have a full support team, you've got eight engineers on board, uh, Usually that's not at the protofacturing stage unless you're launching a new product. Or if you already have manufacturers lined up, you've got uh, RFQs in place, you've got documentation, also a good uh, indicator that you're a little bit too far along for this program. All right. And happy to take questions on this uh, later at the end of the presentation if you had other questions on positioning of the program. So, we have different tracks in this program. That's really just a way of thinking about what your focus is, what your sector is, and how we kind of compartmentalize to think about our content and who you would be most benefiting from talking with and working with. So we have a climate tech track, so that's decarbonization of the economy in some way through hardware. An ag tech track, so anything in the ag sector, we're specific to the Northeast, of course, so if that was an area that you were focused in, we had a lot of resources here, but we're not uh, exclusive to the Northeast. You could be working in the ag sector in a variety of different ways, a variety of different areas. A med tech track, this is any therapeutic or diagnostic device that is generally speaking, improving human health and well-being. And then our classic track, I always feel bad calling it the, the catch-all, but it basically is a catch-all. Any other hardware concept, uh, this fits into our classic track. So if it's not med, ag, or climate, it is classic if it is, in fact, hardware. So just a little bit about these tracks. So your climate tech track is a variety of different ways you can be climate tech, but really you need to be focusing on decarbonizing. You need to have a product that the main advantage of that product is that it is more sustainable. For instance, that's an opportunity to be in the climate tech track. But if you don't care about your carbon footprint, this is probably not your track. That's one good way to think about it. If you're very concerned about the carbon footprint of your product, if that's embedded into your product by default, then you might be a climate tech candidate. Some things about the climate tech track here, how this would work, you would get industry specific mentorship. So we pair you up someone specifically that's worked with a lot of climate tech startups. You would get some resources around calculating your carbon footprint, looking at ways to reduce your carbon footprint or understand your carbon footprint. And then you would have connections to other climate founders. So we have a variety of different companies that have gone through our programs in the years and a number that have been in the climate tech track. So you'd have opportunities to interface with them. Our ag tech track, so broadly speaking, like I mentioned, we do a lot of food and ag programs here. So that falls into kind of two different categories. You've got ag tech that is out on the farm type agriculture. Uh, we've got things that vary into husbandry or food production, but it's gotta be the physical product that supports or improves any of these areas. So anything 
food and ag that really interfaces there that is hardware can fit into our ag tech track. Our ag tech track is sponsored by a specific program. So it's through the EDA University Center program. And um, like I said, there's a variety of different applications here in ag, but you could be focusing on food, food security, climate protection, cutting down environmental impacts, and so on. Our med tech track up next. So this is our newest track right now. It, like I said, it can span therapeutic, diagnostic, or even performance devices to improve overall human health and well-being. Also funded by a specific grant. This is um, the EDA Build Scale Grant. It is in partnership with Wild Cornell. And basically any medical device here could be eligible. So even if you had a medical device, but you were planning to launch it as a consumer product first before going through clinical trials or getting it clinically approved. So that is still eligible. We have a, I've had a couple of folks who have had that question around, well, I'm going to start in the consumer market and then eventually we want to get those clinical trials, get that uh, underway. But due to the cost points and price points, we're going to actually start as a consumer product. That's still valid. You can still be in the med tech track. And then our classic track, like I said, um, this is kind of the catch-all. And I want to point out that the way we interpret hardware is that it's a physical product. So if you don't have software or electronics integrated, that's okay. You can still have a physical product here that falls into the classic track that is eligible for our programs. Um, not a requirement to have electronics involved. Now, we typically do see products that have electronics, but it is not a deal breaker in any way. We have plenty of products that are not software wrapped in plastic. Uh, plenty that don't have electronics involved. So the big thing is that it has to have a hardware component. It can't be a software platform. We've had a variety of different products in this space. Um, like I said, the classic track is really a catch-all. So we've had nonprofits working on products for social good. We've had wearables. We've had um, different femtech products, sports tech, and, and so on. So that kind of falls across the board. If you're not sure what track you fit in, you can certainly apply to the classic track. And if we see that you actually have another application, we would move you. And that's generally true across the board. So when you apply, if you are planning to apply, apply for the track that you think makes the most sense for your technology or your product. If we see that, oh, you actually could be in two different tracks, you're cross-listed across climate and ag, maybe you're thinking about methane production, um, that's an opportunity to be cross-listed. All that means is you get opportunities to interface with people from both tracks, but apply to what you feel is most appropriate. And then when we uh, move forward with your application, we would figure out, is this the right track? Is it a different track? We would talk about that with you. If we have track specific workshops, uh, those are open to everyone, but if we had opportunities, otherwise they might be limited in space. So just something to think about. All right. So logistics here of the program, how does this work? First off, it program is fully virtual. So there is nothing in person that is required. If you are in the area, there are opportunities to interact in person, but there are no requirements to be in person for any part of this program. Our sessions are on Monday afternoons from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. So if you are applying from a different region, um, our sessions are on Eastern time, you would need to make sure those work into your schedule to be admitted to the program. Almost all of our sessions are kind of piggybacked, one business focused session, one technical workshop paired together so that in every two hour chunk, you get a little bit of each. Formally, the program runs from August 19th through uh, December 9th, roughly lines up with the fall semester at Cornell. So what does this look like? Talk a little bit about program structure and the resources that you get from the program. Virtual sessions Monday afternoon. So you get those content sessions, you might get worksheets, you'll be going through workshops, developing, fleshing out details of your business or around the technical product development. And then you would have monthly meetings with your mentor. So that's a um, experienced entrepreneur who is paired with you specifically based on either your track or your product. And um, you get to meet with them monthly to discuss specific things in detail. Beyond that, we have two main tiers of the program. We have an engineering support tier, and then we have a main tier, and those get different technical resources. So let's break those out a little bit. So I'm gonna start over here on the left with the engineering support tier. You get access to all the main content. Uh, that's open to everyone, regardless of which tier you're in. 
There's going to be documentation templates and assessments that come out of those content sessions. You will have access to all of those, possibly some discounted software, mentor meetings. So those are an hour monthly. And then you would have engineering team meetings weekly. So this is where if you're in the engineering support tier, the expectation is a little bit higher in terms of time commitment because you're expected to be able to clear a space 30 to 45 minutes on a weekly basis to touch in with our technical team. Uh, we would have engineering support that's going to work itself out to roughly 10 to 20 hours a week, depending on the product and what feedback we have from you or if we're waiting on a pilot to launch. You know, there's going to be a lighter workload as opposed to if we're preparing for a pilot, there's going to be a heavier workload. So there's a little bit of variance there, but that's kind of what you can expect is 10 to 20 hours a week of a dedicated team of engineers. Through that, you get remote access to our shop. So if you are in the engineering support tier, we are making stuff for you. We are able to fabricate, ship things out to you, and so on. If you're in Ithaca or in the surrounding area and want to come out to Ithaca and you're in the engineering support tier, you have full access to Rev. So we could go through training. You would have access to the facility, to the machines, and so on. Now, the main content here, which you see, is a streamlined version of this. Um, but with a lighter version of engineering support. Normally, if you're in the main content tier, it's because you have an engineering team and you don't need as much engineering support. That means you still get access to the main content, documentation and templates, discounted software. You still get those mentor meetings. And you do still get engineering feedback, but more on a monthly basis. If you had something that you really wanted to have reviewed or you had an issue that you wanted help troubleshooting, uh, we'd be happy to give some feedback there. What that means in terms of expectations is, of course, uh, slightly different between the two tiers. If you're in the main content tier, it's a little bit more straightforward. You're expected to come to the content session, and you're expected to have one main point of contact for your mentor. So you're meeting with that mentor monthly. It should be the same person uh, making sure that you're working out with that schedule with your mentor so that you can have one main person having touch points with them. If you're in the engineering support tier, same basic starting point. You should have one main point of contact for both your mentor and the engineering support team. Those could be two different people, but generally it makes sense for it to be the same one person so that you have alignment of those business and technical goals. But it is in theory possible that you could have different people. We would discuss that in your application moving forward to interviews if you got to that point. Expectations are otherwise generally very similar. Attend content sessions, have your videos turned on, and then complete documentation and requests when we make those asks. So we won't be able to move forward without input from you. So that's our expectation there is that you're going to communicate your timelines and you're gonna send documentation and uh, needed parts or needed, needed things as we go forward and work on developing your product. Some criteria for the engineering support here. So if you're thinking that this is really what you are looking for with the program, I wanna give you a sense of how we evaluate candidates to know who's a good fit for the engineering support tier. First thing we look at is who's on your team. What is your existing engineering support? If you have a full team of engineers, we don't want to be playing telephone, going back and forth, trying to figure out how to develop this product. Especially since we're working virtually, that can be really complicated. So one of our first considerations is what existing support do you have and how do we fit relative to that existing support? Then we look at the availability and consistency of the core team. So we really need, like I said, that one main point of contact that's going to be consistent and available for us to work with if we're going to be successful. So we're looking for someone who's going to be responsive, proactive, coachable, and so on, so that we can actually move things forward in an effective way for everyone. I kind of joke about this term product shop fit, but this is really important. We have specific things that we can do in our shop, specific materials we can work with. We need to make sure that your product aligns with what we can do here. We're going to be building, testing, developing. Um, if it doesn't fit on our machines, if it's too big, that's a big limitation for us. And it means that it's going to slow down how we can develop things. So looking at your scale, scale of product, the industry that you're in, the materials that you need, your stage of development, these all go into thinking about product shop fit and our ability to actually do meaningful work for you. Product team fit, so looking at the expertise that you're requiring and the skills that are on our team. If you are looking for a data scientist, we don't currently have a data scientist, and we will happily tell you that the engineering support here is probably not the right fit, but here are some connections or some resources that might be available. We're happy to try and put you in touch with the right person, but we don't want to waste your time having you work with the wrong people. Like we said up front, most of our team is mechanical, electrical, or design-oriented. And then the last piece that plays into the engineering support tier is your funding availability and timeline. 
you're going to be developing physical products. You're going to need to buy parts. We need to make sure that you have some funding available um, and or a timeline to get to funding relatively soon to make sure that you're going to be able to buy parts, ship parts, and, and so on. On the right here, I have an example candidate. So this would be an example of someone that is a strong candidate for the engineering support. This is a two-person team. Both are maybe full-time on the project. Maybe you have a software and a business background, so you are really focused on developing the software angle, really experienced in developing business model, but you're lacking on the mechanical electrical design side that's a good fit with our team. Product is a small plastic enclosure, maybe some metal mechanisms, fits into a relatively small frame. That's all compatible with our equipment. Great, checks all the boxes there. And you have some runway of funding for the next four months. So we know that over the course of protofacturing, you have funds that you can sink into actually meaningfully advancing your product. I'm going to summarize this pretty quickly because it's all generally very similar to what we just outlined. Uh, just note that engineering support looks a little bit different. So if you're in the main contact here, you do still get some resources. You'll get documentation uh, to review. Well, you send documentation to review in, sorry. Um, you would send documentation and say, I could really use some feedback on um, the manufacturing process for this part that I've designed. And so we would take a look at that documentation. We'd take a look at your part. We'd focus on that element that you told us uh, that you needed some feedback on. We'd send you some notes in advance, and then we'd set up a 30-minute meeting. You just review those notes and any meaningful feedback that we can give there. Here in the engineering support tier, that process is much more involved, much more collaborative. Uh, not so much of a like single touch point of feedback. The engineering support tier has those ongoing weekly meetings. We are setting biweekly or monthly goals with our team and with you to make sure that we're on track in development and everyone's on the same page. We're going to be looking for documentations or files. We need to make sure that if you are looking to quote with a manufacturer, that you're going through the NDA process so that we can get everything quoted successfully and so on. So there's a variety of different things that we can do. I've listed some tasks here, ranging from CAD modeling, prototyping, drawing sets, schematics, and so on. Um, if we can do it, we are going to help you. And that's something that we would also screen for in your interview to get a sense of what are the things that you need to do next so that we can make sure that everything's in alignment. We understand generally what you're looking for. Just to kind of wrap up here, a little bit about our facility. So like I said, product shop fit. We are a prototyping shop, so we don't usually do things in quantities more than five. If you are doing more than five or 10, we would look to set you up with a prototyping house, someone that can quickly give you back 20, 25, 30, 50 parts or so on, um, depending on what makes the most sense for you. But we are a prototyping facility. We have laser cutters, desktop CNCs, 3D printers, uh, both FDM printers and resin printers. We have a water jet, so we can cut a variety of different materials, electronics bench, assembly space, and, and much more. So this is our this is our shop, a few pictures of the inside. Uh, we've got a few new machines that aren't on here, but just to give you a sense, you can imagine roughly what everything looks like and what we're working with. We would encourage you to apply now. So we are going through applications on a weekly basis, doing interviews on a rolling basis. So if you are to apply, the interviews would be lined up pretty soon after that application comes in if we're going to move forward. Deadline for admission is going to be August 2nd, and that engineering support tier is the last thing we decide. So if you are applying, interested in the engineering support, you would be admitted to the main program first. Um, and then once we review everyone in the main program, we're going to determine who's in the engineering support tier all before that August 19th date. What am I missing? I think you got it all. Um, if you go through this program, you know, you're probably done a lot, you prototyped a lot, you go through this program, you're going to start to learn the language you need to learn to get to manufacturing. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that, you know, we know we've been through this, engineers are great at prototyping and you need to start learning a new, a new vocabulary and that, that's the big takeaway. Um, come to the sessions and you're going to just learn the vocabulary you need to learn. Maya, anything I'm missing? I don't think so. I think you covered it all. And I, uh, yeah, put the application link also in the chat. And, um, you know, we'll plan to make sure that we have this sent out tomorrow, this info session video, so everyone can kind of reflect back if you have other questions. But I know we have a few questions in the chat or in the Q&A section, Deanna, if you want to. Yeah. yeah, that was my next, next item here. Okay. Typically, how many companies get selected for each program track? 
that varies every year. We don't have um, a specific quota for the majority of our tracks, generally in the three to 10 something. Yeah, it's really about just um, there's, if you fit into a track and you apply to a track, as long as we think that you fit into that track, we will place you there. Um, this is more of an organizational thing than a like quota system. So uh, mostly just to make sure that we help you get the right resources and the right support. Um, all right. Percentage of companies that have historically been selected, that really varies by our programs. I think with prototyping, it's fairly low. It's been closer to 20% sometimes. I mean, uh, it, it, what's more important for us is fit. You know, if you're too early, this isn't the right cohort. And, and if you're too far along, this is not the right cohort. It's really for people, you know, they, they've done some prototyping and now they need to iterate and get ready for the steps that eventually they'll need to go through for manufacturing. And if it turns out there's too many of you, we'll figure it out. Um, it's a fit question. And, you know, yeah. positioning, um, positioning both of the product and of the timing. We're, we're in all of our programs. I think we're very big on sort of cohortness and people communicating each other and breakouts. So it's important that everyone sort of be not exactly the same place, but kind of sort of the same place because that makes the cohort that much stronger. So that's an important consideration. Can international startups participate in the program? Short answer to this one, yes. Uh, it is a virtual program, so anyone is welcome to participate. We've had a number of international teams in the past few years. Um, clarification on the engineering support. So if you are in the engineering support tier, you can imagine that we are basically like a small product development firm. So we will work to um, design, build, advance. If you have, you should have an existing prototype if you're looking at proto factoring. So basically you'd have to send us the documentation that you have on your product as designed now so that we have a rough starting point or that we at least have some, some touch point of understanding where you're at. And then we work with you to figure out what, what are strategically the next items that need to be designed. We'll go through help work on your CAD, we might do 3D prints, we might do full assembly builds, we might help with documentation. That's something that we work out with you, but imagine that it's like a small product development firm and application. Any other questions on the program? I'm happy to stay online for a few more minutes. How is IP handled? Do you want this one? Yeah, so um, we're all bound by Cornell IP. Uh, so, uh, we're not, you know, we, we, we're not going to run off with anything. Um, we can't ask other members of the cohort to, um, you know, to sign NDAs, you know, 20 odd or 30 odd in the cohort. So it's, it's going to be what you're comfortable sharing with everyone else, but you're going to need to be very comfortable sharing with our team or we can't help you. Um, but a lot of what you're going to talk about is what you're doing and not exactly how you're doing it when you're talking to other members of the cohort. When you're talking to the engineering team, yeah, obviously you got to get you got to get into details. But you know, we're we're already bound by um, you know sort of IP rules being part of this uh, this organization at Europe. Wow. Yeah. So just to follow up on that, if you were working with our engineering team, um, we're bound by Cornell. We can't sign NDAs, but we can't also be written in on any IP. We are developing for you. We don't take any equity. We don't take any anything. It is all yours. Um, we will help as we can. If you are planning to be in the engineering support here to Ken's point, we the expectation we would have is that you're willing to work with us. Um, if, if that's a concern, we can certainly discuss more in the interview. We want to protect IP to the best of our ability. We use the systems that are recommended um, and suggested or requested by the teams that we're working with. Um, we have some internal systems that we use to help us collaborate as a team, but we work with you to figure out what the open questions are. If innovations come up for the other, no, we, we do not claim any IP, um, none of that. Oh yeah, very importantly, we don't take any IP and we don't take any equity. Yeah, we, we take no IP. If something comes up where we say there's a better way to do this um, and we design it, it is, it is yours. We are working for you. We, we will not and cannot be written in on any IP. Anything else? Great. 
We will hang online for um, another minute or two if anything else does come up. But like I said, we're looking forward to seeing your applications. Encourage you to apply. If you are not sure you're in the right positioning for this, you are welcome to apply and we would give you that feedback. Um, Maya, Ken, Lindsay and I, we're all the people on the other end of your application. This is not going to a bot of any variety. So if you are too early, if you're too late, we will happily point you to the right place uh, if it's not protofacturing. Um, for a comprehensive systems, one more question coming in here. Comprehensive system, is it feasible to seek help with a couple of components or subsystems? Yes, um, what I would suggest is that you outline what it is that you are looking for help with, either in your application or in your interview. We would have to see if that's a good fit for our team and we would wanna make sure that it's enough work to merit engineering support. If it's a very small component that is maybe like a couple weeks of work, that might not be a good fit for the engineering support tier, but that is a feasible option to say that we actually have most of this developed and this subsystem has been really finicky. Can, can you look at developing the subsystem? That is something that we, we could- We've had teams about. like that before. Worked out really well. Someone raised their hand. Great. Um, we're going to keep an eye on the chat here for a second. Um, and like I said, we will be keeping an eye out for applications. It looks like um, Prosperity Systems. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was working in the uh, chat because I can't actually see anyone's questions. So I didn't know if things were working. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we yeah, can yes. hear you have okay. a question for the team? Yeah, our, um, we're the ones with that um, all-terrain farm vehicle project. Um, you had interviewed us uh, for yeah. proto prototyping. We are kind of beyond that. So we have, um, we have an engineering team that's essentially buried in projects. They're, it, it's a world-class engineer. And the problem with that is availability to to really be participating there is a drafts person that that works with the engineer and they're also buried as well so we're 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 trying to figure out how can we plug some of those availability gaps and also have some collaboration with engineering working together to flesh out some of the details on subsystems on some some parts it's it's mostly finer details i believe at this point and is that something that could happen within the engineering help where we're more on the CAD side of it rather than building the parts because we can be building them in our facility. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that's, um, it, and I good to hear from you. Um, remember this discussion. So yeah, that is something we can do. We can work more on the system development side and have fabrication help happening in other places. That's all right. Um, I think the best thing to do here would be to flush out a plan for what what are kind of the gaps that you have? What are the, the holes or the subsystems or the big open questions of like, you really need the, the model flushed out for this or you need um, the mechanisms flushed out for that to give us a sense of you know what that would roughly look like. Um, the big things that we would need to double check here for the engineering support tier is gonna be, A, is it gonna be a systems fit in terms of expertise? So that expertise point in terms of what, what we can do um, and to make sure that we're going to be able to move things forward for you. And then making sure that there's enough, enough to do over the course of the program so that it's not a, like, we looked at this, we either didn't get much traction or we have a lot of traction with this, but we need to make sure that we're going to fill out the seven, seven, what am I saying? Seven, four months. <laughs> um, so that's that's really what we're looking at there. We can absolutely do that. We've had a number of people who've applied already that have said, I have someone who's been an engineer on this, but they're swamped. It's something they're doing like kind of part time. And I really need someone to jump in and look at this. Um, that's a totally valid thing for us to look at. OK, good. And to clarify, you said that some of this um, engineering tier is sort of determined um, more in detail after we're in and kind of up and running. You said something to that effect. Yeah, so um, if we had, um, we have a couple other questions coming in, so I wanna make sure we get to those too. Um, but yeah, what we would do is when you apply, we would probably have some basic questions in your interview. If we were kind of like, we, you seem like a good fit, but we aren't quite sure what the technical work's gonna look like, or we wanna make sure, we'd either send you some follow-ups, we'd have a separate call. Um, we just wanna make sure before we commit to a team in the engineering support tier, 
that uh, the work is there and it's a right fit for us. So we might have some follow ups in the early um, between admitting to the main tier and figuring out if you would be a fit for the engineering support tier. There would be some follow ups to figure out what does the subsystem look like? If I don't get enough information from an email, I might ask if you're willing to share like a drawing or a model for us to get a sense of what we're working with. But yeah, that's that's kind of what we go through in the interview process. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how big should a project be, for instance, eight weeks effort for three engineers at 35% effort? Um, that seems like a reasonable calculation. What we're looking for is usually like going through the DFM process, some redesign is a good fit. I am typically not concerned about there being not enough work. I think what generally happens is that we bring people in and there's always something to do and it's a matter of what the right things are for us to do first. Um, if we've had very few people who have said, I just need a single drawing set. Um, so that's not an expectation that I expect to have an issue with. Um, usually it's, it's we have this engineering support here because we know there will be plenty of work with a new team. So um, I would imagine that you can think about it as it's a four month program We've got a handful of projects, a handful of engineers. I think this 30, like three engineers at 35% effort feels about reasonable. But like I said, there will be ebbs and flows between the different projects as somebody might be piloting one week, which means we're totally hands off. And then you get a little more than that. So I wouldn't try and calculate it out too much. Um, we can talk about it in the interview, but I think the three at 35% effort feels roughly reasonable to me. Um, I built working prototypes and demonstrated benchtop models. I'm struggling with fixturing to make the prototypes in larger quantities. Um, so yes, we could help with fixturing and building a ring to proper fixturing. I think that's an example of like, if that were all you wanted from the engineering support tier, we might not be the right fit because that would be something that could be a smaller project. So we'd be looking at more of a long-term goal is like, are you building a hundred prototypes on your own? And then you're switching over to a scaled assembly system Wanted, would want to get a sense of what that project would look like because a, a couple of fixtures to help with the assembly prototypes for slightly larger quantities um, could be a, a feasible product. It's hard for me to answer that without knowing more about the product, and that's something that we sort out in the interview process.